Hello there. This is Cousin Vinny Agnello, critically acclaimed author of The Devil's Glove, and this is our Bedtime with Cousin Vinny series. I'm reading a good segment of The Devil's Glove, and uh, we left off yesterday uh, on page 20, and um, let's continue continue on with The Devil's Glove. He had never dug a grave before in his life, and it gave him plenty of time to reflect upon happier days gone by. The first thing he had to do was carefully remove segments of sod from the area where the boy was to be buried. He realized that this was the best strategy in order to avoid future detection. He figured that he'd bury the boy and replace the sod over the surface of the grave, and no one would ever notice the upheaval. As he broke the earth with his shovel, his mind began to wander again, and suddenly he was reliving the past. He got a mental picture of the ten-year-old Billy arriving at the stadium early in the morning carrying his ball and glove. Michael invited him in, and they made their way onto the playing field together. The boy was mesmerized by the view of the stadium from field level. Michael noticed the hypnotic effect of the huge stadium on him. Gives you a whole new perspective on things, doesn't it? I've never seen anything quite like it. How many people can they fit in this stadium? Billy asked in wonder. 45,000, that's, that's a lot of fannies in the seats, isn't it, Billy? You ain't kidding. So what position do you play? Third base. Got a bat? You want, you want to hit me some grounders? Do I have a bat? Where the hell do you think we are, Billy? What kind of question is that? Michael said kiddingly. It's a dumb one, but then again, what are you waiting for? Got me there, kiddo. I'll be right back. Now don't you go away. These memories brought more tears to Michael's tired old eyes as he continued his dispiriting deed. Despite the tears, the memories continued to play back in his mind. He recalled that the boy was a mighty good ball player for his age, and on this particular day he hit a many hard grounders and he always made the play. On one of the ground balls he made a diving stab and miraculously came up with it. Michael was also fascinated by his left-handed throwing style. His throws seemed to naturally curve and they tailed away from whomever Billy was throwing to. Billy was just plain unique as far as Michael was concerned. I don't think I've seen major leaguers make plays any better than that, kiddo. And boy, do I love to watch you throw. Left-handers are so much fun to watch, Michael complimented. It is kind of neat, huh? You know, if I keep practicing, one of the major leaguers you'll be talking about someday will be me. Don't you think so? Billy asked insecurely fishing for reinforcement. You never know, my boy, but I certainly think you've got a better chance than the majority of them. My dad thinks my older brother's got more talent than I do, but that's only because he doesn't spend any time watching me play. But I'm going to show him. I'm going to show everybody someday. Well, even though I haven't seen your brothers play, I'm inclined to think that your father is very mistaken in his lack of respect toward your ability. You really think so? You wouldn't be just gassing up my head, would you? Billy asked, looking for sincerity in Michael's eyes. Nope. I wouldn't patronize you, kid. I'm a straight shooter. You always get the truth from me. And I've been told on many occasions before that I've got a pretty good eye for talent. Billy, sensing Michael's sincerity, ran over and gave him a big hug. The two walked side by side as Michael started to do his job of creating the baselines. Billy grasped his arm tightly as Michael pushed a line machine down the base and foul lines. The lines the two created were perfectly straight. All this digging was causing too much stress on the old man's back, and he halted momentarily. He was perspiring profusely 
when he checked his watch, which now registered 8 o'clock in the morning. He had a panicked look on his face as he momentarily feared discovery. He took a peek out of the storage shed and looked around the ballpark. It was completely empty, as his lucid mind would have concluded. It was at this time that he knew that the anxiety of this predicament was starting to get the best of him. Nevertheless, he took a deep breath and made a sigh of relief as he stared out into the stillness of the empty stadium. His mind continued to wander, bringing him back to the days when he and Billy would talk for hours in the same stillness that surrounded him now. He recalled how they used to sit around the empty ballpark in the early evening and discuss baseball trivia. Baseball was Billy's favorite subject, and he and Michael would debate the particular merits of the game's heroes for countless hours. As he began digging again, he tried to focus on the details of a particular conversation they shared. Suddenly, he was overjoyed by the fact that he could specifically recall the events of a day he spent with his beloved Billy. Michael recollected one of the many days when he and the boy would sit together behind the White Sox dugout. These occurred during the times when the team was out of town. Billy had a habit of throwing a baseball up in the air and catching it as he kept up his end of the conversation. A smile came to the old man's lips as he remembered this, and he started to hear the boy's words once again. Hey, Michael, do you think anybody will ever, ever top the 60 home runs Ruth hit in 27? Maybe. I mean, Hack hit 56 last year. Yeah, but he's slumping this year. Plus, I think last year was a fluke. Maybe so, my boy. Maybe so. Hey, Michael, why do you think there were so many more home runs hit during the 20s than before then? From what I hear, they played with a dead ball back at the turn of the century. When they changed the ball to one that was livelier, the home run totals naturally went up. Well, that makes sense. A lot of things about the game have changed, Billy. Did you know that in the old days, if you hit the ball on the ground and it continued to roll past the rope at the end of the outfield, you could continue to run as far as you could go. There were no ground rule doubles. You mean there weren't any fences? Billy asked in astonishment. There was no such thing, my boy. The game was in its infancy back then. It wasn't nearly as organized, nor may I add, as popular as it is today. Wow, Michael, you know everything about baseball, don't you? What do you think's wrong with the White Sox? It's the management. Yeah, but I think it's the players too. Second to last for the last two years, and the way things are going this year, it sure looks like dead last to me. Players are too used to losing. My dad says losing's contagious. He says it's a cancer that has to be removed before it spreads. I never agree with him, but I do on this particular issue. I think they need some new personnel. I'll tell you what they really need. They need me. If only I could somehow grow up faster. You don't want to grow up this that fast, kiddo. Enjoy your youth while you got it. Believe me, you'll have plenty of days to discover the not-so-enjoyable benefits of being old. You're old, but you're having a good time of it. Come on, Billy, please, don't bury me yet. Hell, I'm only 40. Speaking of that, my dad says it's strange that you're not married like everybody else, Billy said with a large grin on his face. Well, what am I supposed to say to that one? You tell your dad that I, ha I haven't met the right girl yet. And if he talks back, you tell him to find me a nice girl. Tell him I'm open to all suggestions, Michael said in jest. Believe me, you wouldn't want any girl my father found for you. When he's away from mom, you should see some of the barkers he stares at. What can I say? He has 
very bad taste. I kind of figured that, especially after you told me about how he thinks that your brothers are so much more talented ball players than you are. I didn't tell you, but I went out and saw all three of your brothers play in the game the other day. You did? Well, I figured if I saw them play, I'd have a better understanding of the situation you're in. Anyway, kiddo, you got nothing to worry about. If your father really favors the athletes in your family, then you're going to be the apple of his eye, and as you would put it, that ain't no lie. Me? The apple of my father's eye, huh? Billy questioned dubiously. That's a good one. Oh, by the way, Mike, my father said he'd like to meet you. He says, Billy, I have some reservations about you spending so much time with that Michael guy, Billy mimed. Michael exploded into laughter as he observed Billy's portrayal of the concerned father. Billy broke into a chuckle himself when he noticed that his performance had amused his friend. Well, we don't want him to think that there's anything funny going on now, do we? Billy said while displaying a limp wrist in an attempt to be funny, poking fun of the effeminate mannerisms of some homosexuals. I hope he's not thinking anything like that, Michael said mortified. With him, you never know. I can just picture it now. We sit down to dinner and he looks over at you and says, So, Michael, why the great interest in my son? And I reply flippantly, At least someone is showing him some interest. Then he gets up and knocks you on the floor like he does the rest of us when we give him some lip. Billy quickly interjected. All right. You've convinced me to try a different approach. I've got it. I tell him, Mr. Green, I have no children of my own and that paternal urge is starting to take over. And he snaps, if you want to be a daddy, go make your own baby. Probably, so what do I say to him? You don't have to say anything to him. Just be polite. Hell, you've been more of a father to me in the two months we've known each other than he's ever been. And if you ask me, you're twice the man he'll ever be. That's very nice of you to say. I'm pretty fond of you too, Billy. The boy dropped the ball and scooted over to Michael, giving him a big hug. Michael squeezed the boy tightly. He suddenly broke out of his daydream and decided it was time to take a rest. The summer heat wave was making this job a monumental task. The humidity alone made any kind of physical labor unbearable at this time of the year, not to mention the fact that the old man's back was beginning to feel the strain from all the shoveling. He knew that if he was going to help Billy save face, he had to work on. He figured that he probably had two more hours before the other park employees would arrive on the scene. So under that time constraint, he began to dig once again. As he lifted out of the grave many shovels full of dirt, he reflected back upon more adventures with Billy. He recalled the dinner table when Billy first brought him home. With a large, it was a large mahogany table, and all six of Billy's brothers sat in assigned seats around it. They had squeezed in an extra chair for him so he could sit next to Billy. This was one of the few considerations that the family gave to either one of them. Mr. Green, who made his living as a plumber, sat at the head of the table while Mrs. Green waited on him hand and foot. The old man recalled how Miss, Mrs. Green seemed more like an indentured servant than a wife. She was not allowed to eat until her husband and sons had their fill. Mr. Green, a heavy-set, rugged-looking man, recited a prayer for the food they were about to receive. After he finished, all at the table were silent. No one spoke unless he was spoken to. Mrs. Green had adorned the table with her best china. She stood back away from the table obsequiously, like a waiter waiting to accommodate the needs of anyone seated. The old man remembered how he pitied this woman, who in posture and attitude resembled an old mule. The most outstanding memory of Billy's real family 
was the lack of love between them all. Mr. Green's marriage was loveless, and this air permeated throughout the household. He recalled that the, that the event took place on a Sunday in the late afternoon. The family was having baked chicken. There was a pecking order as Mr. Green made his selections of the pieces of chicken he preferred first. Billy's three older brothers made their choices next. By the time Billy and Michael made their picks, only legs and wings remained. Billy and Michael both had legs. The three younger boys had mostly wings. When the meal was over, all that was left was a wing, some liver, and gizzards for Mrs. Green.